All right, Boz. This topic today is based off of a show we did a couple episodes ago. We did Very Not Random episode 32, which was on the 10 general physical skills, and that was user-submitted content that drove that mm -hmm. show. We've done a show between then and now, but we kind of had in the back of our heads, look, episode 32, the 10 general physical skills, that's one of the four models or you know, standards, fitness standards that are used from the What is Fitness article that Greg Glassman wrote in 2002, the mm -hmm. lecture that's given all around the world at, at level ones. We probably should chat about the other models. And so today we're moving on to the second model, which is the hopper. And when I brought this up to you, I had no idea. Your face just lit up. You're like, oh yeah, oh, yeah. love the hopper model. So let's let's dive in. Yeah, I really do. I, I feel like the hopper more than any of the others is just so rooted in pragmatism and real world application that I think it, it's a really powerful tool to introduce the concept of fitness in a way that people can immediately connect with. It, it takes it out of the realm of this kind of heady academic approach to what can you show me right now and how does that apply to the big picture? So yeah, to me, this is really striking at the core of what it means to be fit and, and the whole philosophy behind CrossFit. I was going to say the teacher looks at the class and goes, you know what, let's go out into the schoolyard. I'll show you what I'm talking about right now. Exactly. That's exactly <laughs> it. <laughs> Put the piece of chalk down. We're going to head out there. So for anyone who's unfamiliar with it, as I said in episode 32, I wholeheartedly encourage anybody who has not go into Google, type in what is fitness, CrossFit, Greg Glassman, 2002, that article will pop up, consider an absolute must read. And that lays the context mm -hmm. for what we're talking about is that that article, what is fitness, changed the course of the fitness industry as far as I'm concerned. And mm -hmm. it, was, it was Greg's, exactly as the title states, what is fitness? Back then, the definitions were loosey-goosey at best, did not lend themselves to being measurable, observable, or repeatable. It didn't sit well with them. And he defined fitness, gave four models to support what he was talking about. And today is going to be that second model. So first of all, if somebody's like, okay, we're going to talk about the hopper. Makes sense. Gotcha. It's the second of four models. Gotcha. What the heck is a hopper? It's a great question. So it's really simple. You have basically a lottery ball mixer or a hopper where you're throwing physical tasks in the mix. Could be anything. It could be a CrossFit workout. It could be hiking through the woods for a you know defined amount of uh, distance. It could be digging a ditch. It could be really anything that you could put a stopwatch to measure the effort, repeat the effort, et cetera. Um, and the idea is that if you're going to talk about fitness and fitness being a broad adaptation, not just the specific thing that you're good at in a very specific context, you have to have a way that you can really look at different tasks and how you perform. So you throw all of these physical tasks in the hopper, you mix it up, you pull it out, and you see how well you do. And you pull out another one and you do the same thing. And you pull out another one and you do the same thing. And over time, if you do that enough, you're going to get a really good picture of how well-rounded the individual is. And so the statement that boils down to is he or she is fittest that is statistically best across the broadest range of activities. Not the person who's really dominant in one area but falls apart during everything else. And that really is at the core, like I said, of the CrossFit philosophy. So it's an awesome, awesome way to start framing the broadness of the fitness that we're trying to develop. So the tasks that we could put into the hopper, you mentioned a few of them, which are great because you could put in a named workout like Fran. Mm -hmm. You could yep. put in your one rep max squat dead bench if you so desired and then cool yep. outside of the gym outside of the box task like we're going to dig a ditch that's two feet deep 50 feet long who's going to do it who's going to do it first you all have the exact yep. same soil because let's not say crazy yep. crazy sure. things like that you know it's all it's all <laughs> if it's fair and we can measure it so are there things yep. is anything fair game is there are there things that aren't okay to put in the hopper or maybe if aren't is not okay is the, not the best phrase are less valuable and less meaningful and some things that are more meaningful? Or can you put literally anything that you want in there? I mean, if you're, if you're really taking this experiment to its end state, then yes, 
nothing is off the table. However, I think the practicality starts to die off when we start looking at really specialized, really select skills or very, very specific activities. You know, yeah, okay. Conceivably, you could throw a unicycle ride in the mix and <laughs> okay. there may be a place for that. It may suggest some things about your balance and other, other, other of those right. 10 skills that we talked about. But is it as practical as something that's more universal? Probably not. So generally speaking, the things that will have overlap to other activities are going to be the at the heart of the hopper. Really, really specific activities. Sure, you could go down that path if you really wanted to, but the utility starts to wane a little bit when you when you get so out there. And could you put in something that would be extreme, for example, and sure. you would think that most people couldn't do without in very dedicated training, such as something like a Hawaii Ironman triathlon that includes a full marathon run, a two point <laughs> whatever swim, 112 miles on the bike. I mean, that's not for the casual person who just hit yeah. the 5 p.m. class to be like, ah, you know what? Let's fire up the old Hawaii Ironman triathlon. Can that go in the hopper as well? Absolutely. You know, all of these things, yes. The question is, what are you trying to do with this as a thought experiment? And like I said, the utility is trying to describe the breadth of fitness that we're looking for. I think a lot of times when people take this and they want to put their little pet activity in that is a really extreme outlier, they're doing so in a way, in my opinion, that they're trying to find a way to delegitimize this as a thought experiment, mm -hmm. not actually to explore it for what it's intended to be. It's, it's usually, look, look, you know, the average CrossFit athlete can't do this, ergo, your model falls apart. It's like, no, 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 you're, you're cherry picking one data point. That is not at all what this is about. What it's about is looking at the overall capacity, not right. how you do in any one thing. And that kind of leads into the classic example that, you know, is still taught at level ones today, um, where you have three different athletes that line up next to each other. One of them is a, an elite endurance athlete, like a marathon runner. On the other end of the spectrum, you have somebody who's a top level power lifter. And in the middle, you have somebody who's like the prototypical CrossFit athlete. You could have a high level games competitor. And so then the experiment is you turn the crank and you pull something out and you see who does the best at that mm -hmm. thing. Maybe, maybe the first one you pull out is a 50 mile run. Well, the, the marathon runner is obviously going to have a leg up there. CrossFitter is probably going to come in second. That powerlifter guy, he's not even going to start the race. He's like, forget right. it. <laughs> right. You know, you turn the crank again, you get a heavy lift. You're like, well, power lifter wins. Crossfitter comes in second. Marathon guy, he knows he's not going to do very well. So he, he probably doesn't even bother stepping up onto the platform. Mm -hmm. You turn the crank again. That third thing that comes out, maybe it's a mix of, of a, uh, an endurance and a strength event. Well, Crossfitter guy now has the huge advantage. He's probably going to come in first on that. You turn the crank again. And, you know, the story is the more you turn that crank and the more blended these activities start to get, the more the advantages that CrossFit athlete is going to have and the more you recognize the deficiencies in these extreme outlier athletes. Yes. Yeah, so, so I, I'll, uh, and I'll, sorry to cut you off, I'll finish the thought there. So then the thought is that if you look at those extreme athletes, like a high-level marathon runner, a high-level powerlifter, it's not that they are not impressive. They are very impressive in their domain. But can they have the claim to be the fittest? Right. Well, on the strongman or the, the strength athlete, it's pretty easy to see the things that he's lacking, especially when it push comes to shove. He's not going to run that marathon. So how can he claim to be the fittest? Mm -hmm. Same thing with the marathon runner. He's going to have an amazing endurance capacity. No slight against that. I mean, that's incredible what, what some of those guys can do. But the list of things that he cannot do is going to be pretty significant as well. That's the sacrifice that he's made in order to get so good at that one thing. So then how can he claim to be the fittest? Best marathon runner? I'll give it to him all day long. But fittest? Nah, there's too many things that he demonstrably cannot do. And there's a couple of things this also identifies, and I tried to scratch them down with my terrible handwriting so I didn't lose them, is, is number one, in my opinion anyway, the hopper becomes more illustrative and more valuable the more tasks that you put on it and, and the yes. more varied that they are. So if there's only five tasks in there, well, 
that's not a lot of variance it, that might sway one way or another. Now, if we're talking 10, 15, 100 different tasks, mm -hmm. that breadth and depth of capacity of what we're trying to accomplish with general physical preparedness so, starts to shine through. And, and then mm -hmm. the more varied, not just a lot of tasks, but the more varied, because you could put a hundred tasks in there, but it's, well, task number one is run four miles, task number two is run five miles, task number three is run six <laughs> miles. That's not a hundred tasks. Okay, we're like, yeah. So we want variance of the tasks as well. And then exactly what you said really starts to shine. And it's like a grade point average, right? Any The mm -hmm. person who comes out as the overall winner may never potentially have won any one particular event, probably had a couple swings and misses, had a couple they did profoundly well on, but overall, they had a quite high capacity in general, no matter what came out of the hopper. And that, at the end, it's like you see at the games. I mean, you can place really well yeah. at the games and never win a single event. You can, right? You could win the games and not win a particular single event if you're just overall doesn't matter what comes your way. The answer is yes, I can do that. This person might beat me on this one, but I'm going to be second. Like it's just you're good to go. And then, yeah, I'm sure you've got something to say, but before I lose it, I want to have this. You mentioned um, the marathon runner and, you know, hey, there's you have to obviously give it a tip of the cap that that person would have incredible endurance capacity, which is absolutely true. But I think what is important to note there as well, and it's one of the things I've, I've learned through CrossFit, is that athlete has incredible endurance capacity at their given domain and skill set. So that, that marathon runner with their endurance capacity, you can't just plop them down on a rower and think that endurance capacity is going to translate over to the rower. It just doesn't quite work that way. Yep, for sure. Yeah. And you know, going back a little bit to something that you said kind of jogged in my mind too. You know, it, I think it's easy to start getting wrapped up in high-level athletes and starting to do that little theoretical comparison. Um, but one of the things that I think is so great about this on a more grounded level is for the average person, you can start to think about, okay, if I'm somebody who wants my fitness to serve me, what does that look like? And for the average person, that doesn't mean that it's going to be, okay, I'm really good at only one thing and all the time I spend in the gym doesn't help me anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Most people are not interested in that when it comes right down to it. Most people are going to be interested in a fitness that lets them play with their kids longer, right. that lets them go do whatever it is they want to do with their friends on the weekend and not feel too beat up about it, that allows them to go, hey, you know what? I have, I have a surf trip that I've never gone surfing before but I have the physical capacity as demonstrated by all these other things that I can do that I know it's not going to be a problem physically. It might be daunting to me. It might be sure. a challenge, you know, all of these things, but I don't have to worry about the raw capacity to get out there and do it. And that kind of physical freedom is something that I think is so important. And especially, you know, you and I kind of representing some of the old guard here, as you've been doing this stuff a little bit longer and you start looking down the barrel of what's going to happen 10, 20, 30 years from now, preserving that is incredibly important. You know, I never want to get mm -hmm. to the point where I'm only okay doing one specific activity and it has these guardrails on. I'm like, no, no, I want my fitness to support me everywhere. And so the hopper really illustrates that idea. I think I just identified why you love the hopper so much because in one of our <laughs> one of our previous podcast and I can't remember which one but we were kind of talking about why we enjoy training or you know why it's important to us and you mentioned that you like just having the ability to say yes that doing crossfit yeah. gives you the ability to say yes and the hopper is kind of the epitome of that is whatever comes out of it you want to be able to say yes yeah I can do yeah. that I might not might not crush it but the answer is yes let's let's exactly. get after it yep for sure and and I'll take it one one more kind of step as far as grounding things in reality, you know, we, we had this episode about the 10 general physical skills. And the idea there, if you guys haven't listened to that episode, go check it out. But the idea there is that we've got these 10 attributes and the fittest person should be well-rounded across all 10. That's great in theory, but it can be really difficult to identify some of those in practice. How do mm. I know that my stamina might not be so good? How do I assess that my coordination isn't as, as 
developed as it could be. Well, let's take you over into the realm of the real. We crank the, the hopper, we pull out something. Oh, a double under muscle up workout pops out of the hopper. And you're like, great, I know I'm gonna fall apart on the rope and I certainly don't have the coordination to do the muscle up yet. Hey, you know what? That points back to those 10 physical skills and says, look, there's a couple here that need some development in order for me to keep moving forward. So it's another way that we can start to ground these other ideas in the practical. What can I do? And if I can't do it, how can I get to the point that I can? I just scratched down double under muscle up on a piece of paper. So my, <laughs> my, <laughs> my affiliate, thanks you. I'm going to create a workout like that because that's, that's a beautiful dirty <laughs> couplet right there yeah. with some interference with the grip and the shoulder in a sneaky yep. way that that's going to, that's going to come people's way. So they can thank you for yeah. that. You're welcome. Lynchpin nation. What's, <laughs> what, what's also cool about that is since you mentioned a specific workout is I, I can't say this with any certainty. I'm just making wild leaps based upon ridiculous things I've seen posted on the internet over the years. I think, as you well know, sometimes people can latch onto one thing and then try to extrapolate, you know, go 10 steps down the road with it, which doesn't make sense. So they might see something like the hopper and in its mm. in a as a singular expression, think that this is CrossFit and then they can shoot holes in it. Unlike we said, this is four models used to support how fitness was defined. I think what some people erroneously did with the hopper model was they would look at this and be like, well, this is just what these people do. You know, they put all this random, uh, right. didn't put any thought into it, random stuff went into the hopper. They pull it out in some nonsensical, no idea, no rhyme or reason to it um, order. And then that's just what they do. So that is not true. That is not accurate. And, you know, we've, we've made mention of that before that of where this thing falls into the overall concept of defining fitness. But I think it's valuable just to take a pause and say, the hopper is a thought experiment, a wonderful thought experiment, but it's more of a thought experiment to do exactly what you spoke about, which is testing the individual mm -hmm. to see, to potentially identify holes, deficiencies, how you stack up against other people. It is not how I would recommend you program uh, because it's something very, un if you're the luckiest person in the world, then maybe you just happen to pull out each day compliments beautifully what happened the day before, <laughs> but the chances of that are very low. You could run the risk of day one, you pull out five by five back squat. Great. Day two, you roll the hopper. It's Karen. Oof, below parallel again, 150 wall balls. What? Okay. That's what the hopper said. Day three, what are we doing? Nancy. Ooh, that doesn't sound too good. Like, <laughs> You, you know, day four, Angie, like it just could, you know, that's why I would not recommend. And that's why CrossFit is not random, nonsensical, just pull any workout you want out of the hopper every day and do it. That's not it. The hopper is a thought experiment, one of the four models to help define fitness. So I think there's just value yeah. in kind of getting yeah, and, that statement out there. And, and I would say that as a tool to inform your programming, it can be really, really helpful However, if it's the only thing that you're doing, you're just turning the crank and hoping for the best, that's just lazy, in my opinion. <laughs> but if you're taking stock of this constellation of results that you're getting from engaging in these workouts regularly, and you start to notice the trend within your own results, or if you're responsible for others in the role of a coach or trainer, you start to notice that in, across the population, there are certain pockets within mm -hmm. that constellation of results that are less developed than others. It's like, oh, that's a huge red you know, beacon that says we need to spend a little bit more time over here and bring that up so that the whole can benefit from it. That's the best implementation of the hopper as a programming tool, in my opinion. And that's what should come ideally in athletes' way whether they're programming for themselves in a garage, going to an affiliate, if the individual doing the programming is throwing beautiful variants their way, then you will have all those high lows, different time domains, rep ranges, loadings. This one has a gymnastics bias. This one is barbell. And you should, over the course of a week or a month, get that value experience. You're like, ah, these days went great. These days I was bottom of the pack. These days, whatever. And ah, that's some very interesting and telling data. Look, mm -hmm. Based upon this, it looks like 
I may want to do some uh, strict pull-ups a few times a week. Might be a good thing for me to do, et cetera, et cetera. Or, eh, my engine isn't quite, you know, I crushed the barbell. You give me a deadlift, I'll knock it out of the park. When those 5K days come up, suddenly I got a bit of a cough and I'm not showing up that day to the class. Like it, it can be very, <laughs> it can be very telling. And that is, that's variance. Random is what we talked about a second ago where you're just willy-nilly pulling things out mm-hmm. and hoping for the best. And that is not only the name of this podcast, by the way, varied, not random, is because those two terms should not be confused. But that is, I think, another thing that could cause confusion to the layman that they just associate those two terms together. Vari- variance and random are not the same things. The tasks that you put into the hopper, you want to have a high degree of variance with those tasks. Now, they will come out in a random order, but those two mm-hmm. are, you know, they are complementary with this model, yet distinct in many ways as well. Yeah, exactly. Let's see. So, yeah, I would think... Uh, I would think that is one of the best things that you said. It's it's useful at identifying deficiencies. It's great because it kind of takes it out of the classroom and out into the real world. And yep. it is one of the most meaningful and beneficial. And I think easiest concepts for people to wrap their heads around. Yeah. You yep. know, we can get into the, maybe the metabolic pathways and things like that. And in, in a, a future show, we do keep going down this road. But this is one of the things most people are like, yeah. I get, I get what you're talking about there, and, and I can put myself in that situation, and I know what I would like to see come out of the hopper, and I yep. know what I would not like to see come out of the hopper. And, and if you can put yourself in that situation, truthfully, yeah. you have a nice little br- blueprint of maybe some areas that your fitness would benefit by you giving it a little bit more time and attention. Yeah, absolutely. And again, to think about fitness on a broad level, it can be very illustrative to the to the person that's just getting exposed to these concepts. When you do have that example of an athlete like a marathon runner, you know, like a, a high level cyclist, you know, th- these athletes are amazing and they often get propped up as the pinnacle of fitness without a deeper understanding of what we are considering to be fit, Mm -hmm. it's hard for the average person to wrap their mind around that person not being fit. You're like, well, look at their performance. It's incredible. How how could you possibly make the argument that they are not the fittest athletes around? And it's like, okay, well, let's talk about that. They're exceptional at one or two of these activities, but is it possible for us to come up with a list of things that they are not going to be very good at. Is it possible that we could come up with a huge, overwhelming body of evidence to suggest that they were not fit as as illustrated by what they cannot do? And the answer is, well, of course, yes, when you start looking into that, it's just most people wouldn't have considered it in those terms without some sort of practical tie-in. Yep, and that's why CrossFit for so many years has just been so big about actually defining the terms that are used because it can be really easy to, a lot of people, you know, I think one of the things that used to be said either by Greg or at lectures was, you know, you get a bunch of people into a room and maybe, let's just say, a ton of them are powerlifters, a ton of them are runners, a ton of them are triathletes, and some of them are CrossFitters, and you address the room and you say, hey, who here would like to improve their fitness? And of course, every single hand goes up, but no two people may be identifying what that fitness word actually mm-hmm. means, even though everyone's yeah. hand went up. So to even start to have the conversation, terms have to be identified. And that was, again, why the What is Fitness article back in 2002 was groundbreaking. So mm-hmm. on that, I think that's all I got, man. I don't know if you've got anything else. Yeah, the me old, too. The old no, I, I, I just, I love the hopper. But uh, <laughs> no, I think, I think I got out what I needed to get out. Perfect. Well, as always, Thanks to everybody for watching or listening to this. As I say at the end of every episode, if you're listening in an audio format, of course, thank you for your support. But Boz and I, we go to the BTWB YouTube channel. We read the comments under the show. So go to the show, post some comments. You now know what we think, but we want to know what you think. We learn just as much from uh, everyone out there and and their experience. You know, 10,000 heads and brains are better than just two right here. So post your thoughts and comments. Is there something we missed? Um, Does this model make sense to you? Does it help you identify any deficiencies in your training? And 
If you have an idea for a future show, let us know because uh, that helps drive the content. So for Adrian Bosman, I'm Pat Sherwood, and we will see you next time.